Good morning, Grace. You may be seated. Changing it up today a little bit, huh? A couple of announcements for you before we get started this morning. First things first, uh, uh, we are ministry partners with the Pregnancy Resource Center over in Joliet, and they have a big banquet coming up that we want to be a part of and support. And so uh, if you're able to attend, I'd encourage you to sign up, sit at one of the tables with uh, some people from Grace Bible Church and represent and uh, support uh, an amazing ministry that is really helping people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So um, can we just, can we praise God for this ministry? I know many of you here uh, serve there. Uh, it's just such a wonderful, such a wonderful ministry. Thank you for those who serve there and uh, who, who do so much there for the sake of the gospel and to help those who are in need. So we thank you for that. Next announcement I have for you, the, the search is over, the wait is over. We have found our student ministry director. Uh, yeah, Justin Yuhan. Praise God. Justin is a remarkable young man who graduated from Moody Bible Institute. He's been serving here in this church for uh, some time now, and so chances are your students, your kids know who he is. A uh, really great guy, really gifted and compassionate and has a desire to see kids love Jesus more. And so be praying for him as he steps into this ministry as a leader uh, and as he points these kids to, to Christ. Pray for him as he disciples and as he evangelizes, and I would encourage you to get to know him. He's He's a, he's a great young man, and I know that you'll be blessed by your friendship with him like I have uh, already. Next announcement I have, last but certainly not least, we have our prayer service that's going to be happening right after this service. And so I would encourage you, please stay. We are going to be praying for the lost. We're going to be praying for those in Uganda and our, even in our own community. And we want to be a church that prays together. So please, please stay and join us. It'll be happening here in the sanctuary about 10 minutes 10, 15 minutes after the service is over. This morning, we are going to be pausing our journey through the book of Genesis. We've been going verse by verse, but this morning, we're going to pause that. And the reason we're pausing that is because our elders feel deeply burdened for our church to grow and become more of a praying church. We believe that a church that does not pray together is a church that is really dead together. And so my sermon this morning is going to be specifically about praying for the lost, the unbelievers. We're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 10. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 10. It's towards the end of the Old Testament. These verses, I believe, will shape our prayer life. And not only that, but these verses should shape our very life. Our whole life. These verses are profound and impactful. And my hope and prayer is that God will write them on our hearts so that we believe that they're true and that we change the way we live so that we can submit to the Word of God. I want to begin this morning by having you think about one of your loved ones. Think about one of your loved ones, a friend or maybe a family member, a co worker, maybe if you are a kid in this room today thinking about one of your classmates. I want you to think about a person specifically who is not a Christian. I want you to think about someone who is not saved. They do not love Jesus. They do not know Jesus. They've rejected Jesus. Or maybe think about someone who claims to be a Christian but is backsliding significantly in their life. I want you to think about that name. A couple, Maybe it's one, two, three people. And I want you to write them down if you have a pen and paper in front of you. If not, keep their names on the forefront of your mind as we go through this sermon. Ezekiel chapter 36, 26 through 27. God says this, And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my rules. My friends, we have to understand that the unbelieving world needs a new heart. Just like we needed a completely new heart. The unbelieving world doesn't just need a nicer heart. The unbelieving world doesn't just need more of a sincere heart. The unbelieving world doesn't even need to just improve their heart through hard work or effort. No, what we have to understand is that the unbelieving world needs a completely new 
heart. It's not just that they need open heart surgery. They need a complete heart transplant. And this is something only God can do. Only God can do this divine surgery on us. And so we must faithfully pray that God would use us. And we need to faithfully pray that God would save them. But you know, I I found that we oftentimes don't pray as we ought to pray. And I think the reason we don't pray like we ought to pray for the lost is because we don't realize that we are powerless to save them. That's something only God can do. And this morning, that's really what I hope to accomplish through the power of the Holy Spirit. My hope and prayer is that you would leave here knowing that you are powerless, but God is powerful. That you would leave here knowing that you are weak, but God is strong. That you would leave here knowing that you are incapable, but God is more than capable to save even those who seem hopelessly lost and those that we think would never possibly come to saving faith. God has the ability to save them. He can do this open heart surgery that they need. And so this morning, you're going to hear me say things that preachers of old would say. These are things they would regularly preach in the pulpit. These are things that they would say throughout church history. These are things that they would teach and things that they would say and things that they would love and uh, the things, the truths that they would cherish. These are the truths and hills that they would die on. But I think those days are, are long past. We live in times where the majority no longer depend on the word of God when it comes to saving the lost. And when I say majority, I'm not talking about the unbelieving world, even though they have no concept of this idea. I'm unfortunately talking about people who claim to be Christians and people who claim to be pastors who no longer depend on the word of God to save unbelievers, but who instead put their hope and their trust in how big their church budget is. They put their hope and trust in their social media. They put their hope and their trust to save the lost with their graphics and their church branding and how good their band sounds on Sunday mornings. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not saying that these things are are bad things. We should strive to do these things with excellence because we serve a God who is more than excellent and he is worthy of our praise and he's worthy of our best efforts. But what we have to remember is that God does not need one ounce of these things in order to save the unbelieving world. He doesn't even need an ounce of these things in order to flip this community upside down to save people in Shorewood and in Manuka and in Morris and Shanahan and Plainfield and Joliet. He doesn't need an ounce of our cleverness. He has the power to do it with or without us. But in his grace and mercy, he chooses to do it with us. Isn't that amazing and even a mystery to me at times? And so this morning, we will grow in prayer, and my hope and prayer is that we would understand that God is the one who will give the people a new heart and a new spirit, and so we must be a praying people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer now. Father, your word says that you are holy, holy, holy. You are the Lord and creator and designer and sustainer of the universe. By your word, you bring life. And so God, I pray right now that you would bring life into this room, that you would shape us and mold us and transform us, that we would humble ourselves before your word, that we would see that we are ants compared to you. And God, I pray that we would cry out to you and ask you to intervene to save those that we love because we are powerless to save them. And so, God, we love you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, as we go through this, whether you are a fifth grader or whether you are someone here who's in your 70s, think about that person that we talked about in the very beginning of the sermon someone that God has laid on your heart, someone that needs Jesus, that needs the gospel. Think about them as we go through this text. 
Now, the immediate context of this passage, I want to be clear, it has to do with the restoration of the nation of Israel, but I believe that the implications of this text are much deeper and greater than that. God has something here for us this morning. Point number one, the hand of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 1, this is what it says. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. I want you to notice God is doing something here in this very first verse, and this is something that I think is critically important for every Christian's ministry, whether it be discipling your children, whether it be mentoring, whether it be evangelizing, whether it be preaching, whether it be serving. We all desperately need God to do this to us if our ministry is going to be effective at all. Ezekiel says, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And so God is not just giving Ezekiel a vision. What God is doing here is giving Ezekiel a calling. He's giving this man a purpose. He is giving this man a mission. He is setting this man apart for a specific ministry. And so he is giving Ezekiel a deep desire He is giving Ezekiel a deep yearning in his soul. It's as if his hand is being placed on Ezekiel and he's giving Ezekiel a great burden. You see, Ezekiel, he must preach. He must teach. He must bring the word of the Lord to the lost. He has to do these things. He has no choice to do these things. They have become his great burden It has become his great passion. If he doesn't do these things, he might as well implode because his soul will not be satisfied until the lost come to saving faith. This is what God has done in him within this verse. I want to pause here for a second. Have you ever thought that before? Have you ever felt this burden before? Have you ever felt this about your unbelieving spouse? Have you ever felt this burden or passion for your own children or family members? Have you ever felt this burden for your coworkers or classmates or teachers? Have you ever felt this yearning within your soul for a specific group of people that you love? This burning desire that I must bring them the gospel. I must tell them about Jesus. I'm not going to be satisfied until they come to saving faith. Have you ever felt that burden before? Oh, that we would be men and women who prayed that God would do this in us. Men and women who prayed, Lord, please put your hand on me like you did to the prophet Ezekiel. Oh, Lord, put your hand on me like you did to the prophet Jeremiah, who once said, if I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart, as it were, a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I'm wary with holding it in, and I cannot. Oh, that God would make us like the apostle Paul, who said, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Do you have a specific people, a specific person that you are burdened for? If not, pray. Pray that God would have a great, that he would place a great burden on you to share the gospel. I want you to write that down. Pray that we would have a great burden to share the gospel, that God's hand would be placed on us because, hey, I, I get it, I get it. A lot of times when we preach about evangelism, some of us think to ourselves, okay, this is not about me. I don't have to do this. This is for the missionary. This is for for the person who has the gift of evangelism. But the truth is, is that this is for every single one of us in this room. Our captain, our king has commissioned us to go and make disciples of all nations. And for some of us, it might not be going overseas. It might be just our backyard. It might be even within our own home with our own family. Point number two, 
the valley of dry bones. Let's make some observations about this. Verse 1 continues and it says, that God brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. I want you to notice how God is leading here. The spirit of the Lord, notice, the spirit of the Lord doesn't uh, lead Ezekiel by telling him, okay, Ezekiel, okay, I want you to build a really big, nice building, and I want you to put flashy lights inside of it, and I want you to make a fog machine in the back, and I want it to have a rocking band so that these dry bones will rattle and run in through the front door. He doesn't say that. God doesn't lead Ezekiel in this way. Uh, the Spirit doesn't lead Ezekiel by saying, okay, Ezekiel, I really need you to start working on your personality because you've got to have a better personality if these, these bones are going to start rattling. He doesn't do that. The Spirit doesn't lead him in this way. The Spirit also doesn't lead him by saying, okay, Ezekiel, build it, and these dry bones will come right through the front door. He doesn't do that either. Why? Because dead bones can't get up and walk. And so the Christian must go, and the Christian must minister, and the Christian must stay where the dry, dead bones are. They must do these things. And isn't this the Great Commission? Again, our Lord Jesus Christ tells us, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, why is God doing this to his prophet? Why, why, go, why go through this trouble? Why is God giving him this vision? Why is God leading him into the valley of dry bones? I, I think there's two reasons why. The first reason is so that he would understand the spiritual reality of the community that he lives in. That he would understand that these uh, bones, that this community, that the nation of Israel really is dead spiritually. I mean, God is giving him a front row seat so that he can see what their heart looks like. And he compares this nation to a valley of dry bones, and not just bones, but he says this in verse 2. It says, And he led me among them, and behold, they were, uh, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry. And so we see that there's very many, and we see that they are very dry, I want you to understand the picture that God is painting here for Ezekiel because it's true for us as well. Ezekiel is in a graveyard. He's in a graveyard. He's in a place that is completely lifeless. Death and decay are all around him. He's in a place that is without hope. And any suggestion that there could be life in this graveyard would seem preposterous, I think, to all of us. This is the condition of the nation of Israel. This is Ezekiel's reality. He's surrounded by people who are spiritually dead. And my friends, the same is true for us as well. The same is true for us as well. We live in a valley of dry bones. We live in a world surrounded by people who are spiritually dead. It's like living in a graveyard ourselves. Our workplace is a valley of dry bones. Your neighborhood is a valley of dry bones. Our schools, your middle school, your high school, your college, a valley of dry bones. The largest populated city in the world is a valley of dry bones, everywhere the unbelieving world goes is in fact a valley of dry bones. It's nothing more than a graveyard that is hopelessly dead. And so I think we need to pray. Pray that we would have discernment, spiritual discernment to see that the lost are truly lost. We need to pray that we would understand what we're up against. We need to pray that we would understand how severe the problem is that the unbelieving world has. You know, I think one of the greatest problems in the evangelical church today as a whole is that we don't understand how lost the lost actually are. We don't understand that the world has a wicked heart, that they are filled to the brim with darkness, that they are blind to the truth about God, even though 
it's staring right back at them in front of their faces that they really do, in fact, hate God, that they really do reject God. And, and so this noble work that we must do is also impossible work. And that's the second reason why God leads Ezekiel into the valley, so that he would understand first the reality of his community, and then secondly, that he would understand that he is powerless to do this impossible work without God. You know, spiritual deadness and unbelief is not a minor problem that can be fixed with our cleverness or man-made wisdom. This is not a problem that we can cure with clever, uh, with, with clever and strategic church, church growth strategies and techniques. This is not a problem uh, that our programs can fix, that our money can fix, that our stage design or graphics can fix. No, this condition that the lost have is so severe that it is an impossibility for us. We are too weak. We are incapable of bringing the dead to life, and it will always, always be that way for us. And so God, I think, leads Ezekiel into this valley so that he would understand that. And then something unexpected happens. In the middle of this valley, God asks Ezekiel a question. Verse 3, it says, And God said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. You know. This question is a question that I think every Christian must answer. Uh, This is a question that we must answer before we're commissioned, before we are sent out into the world to share the gospel. Every single Christian must answer this question, and how we answer this question will determine the trajectory of our entire ministry, and I think will determine even how we view God himself. Can these bones live? Notice how Ezekiel answers. He doesn't say, yeah, of course, God. Of course they can live. He doesn't say that as though he can manipulate God into doing what he wants him to do. But at the same time, Ezekiel doesn't say, no, God, that's impossible for these dry bones. Ezekiel doesn't doubt God. Ezekiel simply says, oh, Lord God, you know. You see, this is a man who knows that God is gracious. He knows that God is merciful. He knows that God is sovereign. He knows that God is in control. And so he understands that if these bones are going to have life, if the lost are going to be found, if the spiritually dead are going to be made spiritually alive, then it is entirely up to the God who created them. And we have to understand this about the unbelieving world around us as well. Again, think about that name you wrote down. Think about that person you long to see come to Jesus. They need God's power in them. Uh, listen, I, I, I know that there are some of you here this morning who urgently evangelize. I know that there are some of you here this morning who are passionate about telling your friends and family members about Jesus. I know that you have a broken heart for your mom who doesn't know God. I know that you have a broken heart for your dad who doesn't know God. Maybe a broken heart for your kids. You keep seeing them, seeing them run from God and run from God and you're heartbroken. You want them to come to Jesus and it breaks your heart because you have the answer, you have the solution, but they just won't listen to you. I know that you wish that you can reach into the deepest part of their heart, the darkest place of their heart and flip that light switch on so that they can have eyes to see. But it is impossible for us. Just like me, you've come face to face with the fact that you cannot save this person. No matter how hard you try, you can't change their heart. No matter how hard you try, you can't force them to love Jesus. It is an utter impossibility for you. And so we're reminded, aren't we? We are nothing without the Holy Spirit. We can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. 
Our dearest loved ones have a problem. And no matter how hard we try to fix that problem, we can never do it. We try and we try and we wish that we could reach the darkest place of their heart, but it is impossible. Listen, they are so broken that we cannot mend them. They are so blind to the truth, we can't give them new eyes. Even though we love them so much, our love cannot change them or save them. There is nothing our, in our power that we can do to bring these dry bones to life. And that is exactly the point of this passage. It brings the preacher, the disciple maker, the evangelist, the parent, the friend, it brings the Christian to a place where they realize, I really am weak. I really am a weak person who desperately needs to rely on God's power if my family members are going to get saved. You have to understand something. There's no such thing as great men and women of faith. Only weak men and women of faith who are desperate and needy, needy for God to intervene. And so you see, we cannot do this. Our, our, this is an impossibility, this work for us. This is a hurdle we can't jump. This is a mountain we can't climb. We'll never reach the top. But there is one who can. There is one who can. And by his very word, he spoke all things into existence. By his very word, he spoke into the darkness and he said, let there be light. And there was light. By his very word, he separated the light from the darkness. And by his word, uh, this, these dry bones can come to life. Listen, we cannot reach the deepest part of our unbelieving friend or family member's heart. But the word of God can go where we can never go. The word of God can go where we can never go. Why? Because the word of God is living and active and it is sharper than any two-edged sword and it is piercing to the division of the soul and of the spirit, of the joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And the word of God is ultimately Christ. Christ can go where it's impossible for me to go. Christ can do what is impossible for us to do. Only Christ is strong enough to storm the cold gates of the unbelieving person's heart. Only Christ has the power to step into the darkest corner of their life and boldly say, let there be light. He is the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And so God says to Ezekiel, O son of man, can these dry bones live? And Ezekiel says, Oh Lord God, you know. You know. Let us be a church that prays that we would understand that we are powerless to save the lost, to save dry bones. Which leads me to point number three, the word of the Lord. Ezekiel 37, four through six. It says this, Then he said to me, God said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. You see, God wants Ezekiel to do something. Even though Ezekiel is powerless, God still has a desire to use Ezekiel. And I think this is really important for us to understand. Even though God is sovereign in our salvation, we are not just to sit on our hands and do nothing. We are not to sit there and think to ourselves, well, I can't save anyone, better just leave it to God. No, we have a part to play in this as well. And if we just sit back and do nothing, that's actually sinful to absolutely do nothing. That is actually sin for us. I want you to notice, God is determined to work through Ezekiel. He's determined to work through you and me. I don't know why he chooses to do it, but he chooses to work through the middle schooler. 
He chooses to work through the high schooler, the college student. He chooses to work through the Christian who is in their 20s or 30s and 40s. He chooses to work through the Christian who is much older and who has been following Christ for years and years and years. He chooses to use us to be his mouthpiece and his instrument, his messenger. He does this through us, and it's a mystery as to why, but he loves us, and he wants us to be a part of this. And so God is telling Ezekiel that the cure for spiritual death is speaking forth God's holy word. You think that's strange? Do you doubt that? Like, does that sound crazy to you? That these dry bones are going to come to life if I speak forth God's holy word. You know, I know the unbelieving world finds that offensive and ridiculous, and that doesn't surprise me. That's what the word of God says. But what surprises me is when you have Christians and people in the church who believe that that's foolish. People in the church who say things like, hey, we need more than the gospel to reach the lost. We need, we need more than the gospel. We need more programs in our church. We need more money in our church to reach the lost. No, we don't. We need to equip the congregation to proclaim the gospel. We need to equip the church to, to proclaim the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, now notice verses 4 to 6 that God is telling Ezekiel exactly what to say. He doesn't need to change a word. He doesn't need to spice it up. He doesn't need to make it more relevant. He doesn't need to change a thing. He simply needs to say, thus says the Lord. And that's something that takes faith, isn't it? It takes faith to believe that God's word doesn't return void. It takes faith to believe that God's word is enough. It takes faith to share, uh, to share it the way God wants us to share it. It takes faith because to our eyes it looks foolish. But this is what God uses. This is what he's determined to use. Now, now notice he also uh, is to share this message with bones, with the bones truthfully. God says Ezekiel, uh, he says Ezekiel in, in verse four, call dry bones, dry bones. Don't pretend like they're not dry bones. Don't pretend like they're alive. Don't pretend like they're walking. Don't pretend like they have skin and breath in them. Call dry bones, dry bones. And I think this is important because we have a tendency to downplay sin when we share the gospel. But we are not to sugarcoat it. We are not to sugarcoat the bad news that we are sinful and that we are deserving of hell. You see, if we diminish that truth, we diminish the power of the gospel. It's important for us to understand that, to hear regularly in the pulpit that we are people that wrestle through sin. And Grace family, my friends, listen, I love you so much. Like You, you need to hear that. You need to hear that from your pastor, that I truly love you, that my wife loves you, that we, would, we love pouring ourselves out for you. You are so important to us. We think about you. We pray for you. We want to stay here and have our roots deep in this church and in this community. We love you. And because I love you so much, I want you to regularly hear sermons that are addressing sin. Why? Because I want you to hate your sin because I want you to love Christ. I want you to have a deep love for Christ. And the same is true with the unbelieving world. We need to love them so much that we tell them the truth. Dry bones are dry bones. And until dry bones see that they're dry bones, they won't see the living water that is Jesus Christ. And again, notice, even though it will be Ezekiel talking, it's going to be God who's going to be the one who puts breath in them. It's going to be God who puts sinews upon them and covers them with flesh. Why? Uh, Look at the end of verse 6. So you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. There's going to be no mistake that it was God who resurrected these dry, dead bones. And isn't this how God always works? God always uses the runt of the litter to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. He always, uses, uh, uh, he always uses the dullest crayon, doesn't he? He always uses the weakest. You might be sitting there thinking to yourself, man, I am too weak to share the gospel. I don't know enough to share the gospel. I can't, I can't do it. I don't have the time to do it. I, I'm too weak and too foolish to do it. Uh, that's how it always is. That's how it always is. Listen, if you're a Christian, I already know something about you. There's something seriously wrong with you. 
<laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I, like, just, just look at me. There's plenty wrong with me. And if you don't believe it, you can ask my wife, go out to coffee. She'll tell you all about it. There is so much wrong with us. And yet God uses us. He loves us. And he loves the unbelieving world. And he accomplishes much to the weak. And so we need to pray that even though we're weak, that we would bring the word of truth to dead places. Again, think of that name you wrote down. Think about that person who doesn't know Jesus. How are you going to bring the word of truth into that dead place? Lastly, point number four, the great army, the great army. Verses seven through eight, so I prophesied as I was commanded And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. You see, Ezekiel, this is amazing, he doesn't question God. He doesn't run away from God's calling. He doesn't doubt God. He simply prophesied as he was commanded. And in that moment, bones begin to rattle. Could you just imagine what that sounded like? Uh, They start moving and they start coming together bone to bone. Veins and muscles are placed on the bone and flesh begins to cover them. It's the first sign of new life. God was right. The word does bring life. And you know what? I, I wonder if we were Ezekiel, if we would have just stopped right here. I mean, I mean, think about it. We would have saw this and we would have been like, oh man, look at these bones. Look at them. They're rattling. Wow. They're actually rattling. They're coming together. I mean, isn't it amazing? There's muscle and veins and tissues and skin all over these bones. And I wonder if we would have just stopped right there. Said our work's done and moved on. But the truth is that Ezekiel's work is not done here. Why? Why? Because these dry, dead bones that have skin on them are still corpses. They still have no breath in them. They are still lifeless. They still need breath in their lungs. And so Ezekiel must continue to plow the field and plow the field and plow the field and share the word of the Lord until the work is done. Last two verses. Last two verses. Verses 9 to 10, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. You know, I think this verse is so beautiful because the language here is the same language we see in Genesis chapter 1 and the very beginning of the creation account. That word wind here uh, is the same Hebrew word used for the word spirit, the spirit that was hovering over the face of the deep. And so this text is showing us that the same word that spoke the universe into existence is the same word that brings the dead to life, that makes those spiritually dead, alive. Could you just imagine that? That person that you're praying for, being a part of this great army for God. Could you just imagine your son or your daughter? Could you just imagine your coworker, your boss, your next door neighbor? Can you just imagine that person that drives you nuts? After years and years and years of faithfully plowing the field, sharing the gospel message. The word of the Lord saves them. My friends, we must be faithful. We must be faithful. And this is a picture of uh, really something, a theme that's in the entire Bible. And that theme is that God's word always creates God's people. In Genesis chapter 1, God's word goes out in the form of a command. And God creates the entire universe, including mankind. Why? Why? Because God's word creates God's people. In Genesis chapter 12, God's word goes out in the form of a promise. And Abram, this sinful man, follows that call. Why? Because God's word always creates God's people. In Exodus chapter 20, God's word goes out in the form of 
Ten Commandments, and this law is given to the nation of Israel, and this law is to point them to the truth about God, and it transforms them. Why? Because God's Word always creates God's people. We look at Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones. God's Word goes out, to the, out in the form of a prophecy. And these dry bones come to life and become a great army. Why? Because God's Word always creates God's people. Until finally, finally, God's word comes in the form of himself, a person, Jesus Christ. And it transformed your life forever. Why? Because God's word always creates God's people. Let us be a people that pray that God's word would continue to create God's people in this community and in Uganda overseas. We're going to enter into a time of communion right now. And communion is a time for the church. It's a time for those of us who are Christians. And so if if you're not a Christian here today, I want you to know I'm so thankful that you're here. I would love to talk with you and answer any questions that you, uh, you might have. But this is a time only for Christians. And so I would ask that you would just let the cup, uh, the, the juice and the cracker pass you by. But as the ushers come down during this last song, uh, church family, my prayer is that you would really think about these things, that you would think about how you were once dead in your sin like these dry bones and how God made you alive. Let's pray.